Uh, I want to turn now, if we could, to our keynote address. And we're very lucky this afternoon to have with us Robert Glennon, the Regents Professor and Morris K. Udall Professor of Law at the University of Arizona. Uh, Robert Glennon is one of the nation's preeminent experts on water policy and law, a recipient of two National Science Foundation grants. He serves as the Water Policy Advisor to Pima County, Arizona, as a member of the American Rivers Science and Technical Advisory Committee, and as a commentator analyst for various television and radio programs. He's also a Huffman Post blogger. <clears throat> and in 2014, Dr. Glennon and two co-authors co collaborated with the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution to explore solutions to the broken federal and state laws that are contributing to worsening water shortages in California and the other western states. Their groundbreaking report entitled Shopping for Water, How the Water Market Can Mitigate Water Shortages in the American West is viewed by many as a game changer for water policy moving forward. His book, Unquenchable, America's Water Crisis and What to Do About It, was published in April 2009. And Professor Glennon's, Glennon's best known publication is Water Follies, Groundwater Pumping, and the Fate of America's Fresh Waters, which received accolades from Scientific American, from the Washington Post, and the New York Review of Books. Professor Glennon received a JD from the Boston College of Law uh, at the Boston College Law School, and an MA and PhD in American History from Brandeis University. He's a member of the bars of both Arizona and Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Robert Glennon. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Uh, good, af <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, I really wished I could have been here for the event last night, but I was teaching yesterday afternoon. But I did get here for most of the morning sessions, and they were really, they're really uh, terrific, uh, terrific uh, uh, presentations. Uh, I, Kevin, I appreciate the introduction. I am grateful for the invitation to be here, uh, and I. I just want to say, at a time when many people find it difficult to take meaning from their jobs, I look at what you folks are doing, and you're, doing, you're pursuing a noble cause, a noble calling, uh, trying to provide water and, 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 and sanitation services to people. What, a, what an incredible thing you're doing, and my hat's off to you for it. Uh, I'm going to try and do several things uh, this afternoon with you. I'd like to give a quick snapshot about what's happening around the globe, uh, bring it home to talk a little bit about the situation in water in the United States. And then I hope you won't think it uh, too simplistic, but I'm going to frame it as simply a question of supply and, and demand. And that being the case, what do we do about it? What are the solutions to the imbalance between supply and demand? And then I thought I'd finish up with a few comments about some challenges facing the water industry. Kevin thought that those comments might, might particularly resonate with you. So first, the, the, the global situation. You know, we're so lucky in the United States compared to what ha is happening around many parts of the, of the globe. Um, there are about seven billion of us on this planet, and more than one billion of us lack access to water. 2.6 billion people lack access to sanitation. Uh, as shocking as it seems, there are still people dying from waterborne diseases and most of them are, are children around the globe. And when you look forward, the demographers predict that the seven billion of us now on this planet will be more than nine billion by mid-century under a modest projection of population growth, not the most extreme by any means. And then the challenge is really very sharply etched, I think. Where on earth are the resources going to come from, water and other things? to support an additional two billion fellow citizens of this globe. Then you have to factor in climate change. And this, this particular graph is, is really very powerful. It looks almost cartoonish. But look at those arrows and, and think about just how every one of those arrows is an important statement. And they are all pointed in the wrong direction. And think about what's happened in the last month or six weeks. Uh, the fires, of course, in California, but the, the, the hurricane in first uh, Houston, and then the Caribbean, and Puerto Rico, and Florida. Um, and you realize that while you can't say with any certainty that any one storm is anything more than simply weather variability, when you look at those factors and you realize that you are creating this incredible 
ability for storms to have more ferocity, which is what we just saw, you start to say, you know, there's something to this. Add into that that never have there been two Category 4 hurricanes in a single season, or 10 hurricanes at all in a single season, and you start to say there's something to this. And the consequences for water and water supply from climate change are, are tremendous. So the last three years have been historic highs. I expect the uh, the New York Times' is Justin Gillis is going to write the same column in January 18 as he did in, in 16, 15, and 14. Of the 17 hottest years on record in the last hundred and whatever years, 16 of them have been since the year 2000. 16 since the year 2000. So how does this impact water? Farmers consume, consume, not divert, consume, 80% of the water, and it's very clear, the Bureau of Reclamation has found so in studies of farmers around the West, that to grow the same amount of food is going to take more water, but the farmers are already consuming 80%, and we're talking about an additional 2 billion people. How is this going to work? <clears throat> this is a photograph of Oroville Dam. How many of you are from Northern California? Um, uh, it's been a tough time, tough year in Northern California. That's uh, the evacuation, the, people, the number of people evacuated was about 180,000. And we know that it was because the dam had not been maintained properly. But Oroville was just one dam, and it could have happened to a lot of other dams around the country. Many of the dams traced the New Deal period, 30s, 40s, 50s. They've come to the kind of the ebb of their uh, useful life expectancy, and we have not maintained them. There's something else, though, in terms of water that is problematic about Orville, and that is that the dams that we did build in the mid 20th century were sized and expected to deal with the hydrology and the hydrograph as it existed in the mid-20th century. But that's not a hydrograph that we have going forward. And as climate change creates ever more severe sine curves with higher highs and deeper lows and more violent storms when we get these storms, uh, the pattern of water availability is profoundly different. Now, most people, I think, when they think about where do we keep water, they think about the reservoirs and the dams that hold the water back in the reservoirs. But most of us are from the West, and we know that our water supply in the West is not in the reservoirs, it's in the mountains, and it's called snowpack. And when you have a, an increasing, uh, increasing temperatures, the snow doesn't stay there. It comes later, leaves earlier, you have more, snow melt at, at different times, and once the, the snow is in melted form, then it's more susceptible to evaporation loss. So not only in some places will there be less precipitation, but the precipitation that is, is going to be coming at the wrong time, and, and the water won't be filling the reservoirs. So climate change is a huge challenge. On the United States, uh, I've written a couple, of, a couple of books about water. Um, the, the situation is um, challenging. Uh, this map of, uh, that the University of Nebraska puts out every week, I know some of you deal with these maps all the time, it looks so different than it did last year, right? Last year you folks were deep red in California, but you had the huge storm, the huge uh, winter, rather, uh, uh, season this past year, very, very wet. And you look at the East Coast, they would have had some red sections, but hey, this is after the hurricanes. So things look pretty good, except for Montana. And I was in Montana in late July and early August, and the, the fires there, well, they're just not going to go out until you have snow. And that started, they've started to go out, but that's how long they've been, been, been burning. Elsewhere around the West, California's drought has ended, but the drought in the Colorado River has not ended. And that is, that system is now in the 15th year 
uh, of a drought. And no one knows whether it's the 15th year of a 15-year drought or the 15th year of a 50-year drought. <clears throat> but the iconic bathtub ring around Lake Mead is there and it's not getting better. In fact, it's, it's getting worse. And it's getting worse because there's a basic disconnect between the amount of water that we have doled out in terms of water rights, seven and a half million acre feet to the upper basin, seven and a half million acre feet to the lower basin, 1.5 million acre feet to the Republic of Mexico. Okay, now the, the, the math this morning that I saw on the board with all those equations, way above my pay scale, you know, but 7.5 plus 7.5 plus 1.5, I can do that. That's 16.5. The problem is that the tree ring scientists at the University of Arizona have discovered that there isn't 16.5 million acre feet in the Colorado. Instead, over the last thousand years, the average flow has been more like 14 million acre feet. Oh, and then you've got evaporation loss off the surface of Lake Powell, which is 200 miles long, and Lake Mead, which is almost as long, and that's 1.6 million acre feet. So the 14 million now becomes 12.4. Then we can factor in climate change. And climate change, it depends on who you believe, somewhere between 10 and 25 percent reduction for the Colorado River. And you start to realize that's more than the entire allocation for the state of California. 4.4 million acre feet, and this system is in a deficit that exceeds that. So the supply is challenged, but the demand seemed to be insatiable. Um, this is one, I was the first to point the finger at, at bottled water in my book, Water Follies. Uh, Jennifer Aniston here telling you, you'll. You know, you'll, I think she's saying you'll look beautiful if you drink smart water. I think that's, I think that's the, you know, that, that's, that's, I think the message. Uh, uh, you know, and, and bottled water is, is no better, no safer than tap water. It's not regulated as much. Uh, uh, you know that. I don't need to, 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 to go there with you. I would just say that it's kind of indulgent. Uh, people are paying a thousand times more for water that, that they don't get any additional benefit from. Um, but we, as a group, can be incredibly narcissistic. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is Kohler's power shower. Uh, there are 10 shower heads, each with enough water pressure to take paint off walls. <laughs> uh, th these are very popular in Phoenix, which is why we in Tucson look down our noses at people in Phoenix. So. Uh, you know, don't you have 10 shower heads in your own? Uh, Ed Abbey, an Arizonan, a curmudgeon of the first order, uh, an elegant, uh, profound writer, sort of a nasty son of a gun in real life. But when he wrote uh, at his best, he was, he was really poetic. So plenty of water in the Mojave Desert unless you try to establish a city where no city should be. Well, of course, that would be the city of Las Vegas. And this is the Bellagio Fountain. How many of you, uh, I want to see a show of hands. <clears throat> How many of you love the Bellagio Fountain? Okay, all right. How many of you hate the Bellagio Fountain? Uh, more like than dislike, okay. Um, so this is, um, was Steve Wynn's baby. So when he was going to do the Bellagio, he wanted to have a feature. And he went to Pat Mulroy, the iconic uh, head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. He said, she said, he said to her, I want a water feature, Pat. So I gotta have a water feature, that's my concept. And she said, okay, Steve, are you prepared to double plumb the hotel? Are you prepared to put a reverse osmosis system in the basement and clean up that contaminated water? And by the way, have instant on hot water in every room, low flow fixtures, low flow, high efficiency toilets, Long list. He said yes to all of it. And so he did, and they did. That fountain, it's all recycled water. And when you look at the water use in Las Vegas, you see actually she did a heck of a job encouraging conservation. And that, that area of the state, the strip, uses 3% of Las Vegas' water. And yet it is the economic driver second to none. And so as we look forward, we, we cannot avoid thinking about the economic value of water. 
that has to be an important variable as we think about what we're going to do about the challenges. Now this, well this could be right where we are. This could be Las Vegas. It happens to be more around Palm Springs. There you've got the Mojave Desert. Uh, every house has a, a, a lawn and most have pools. I, I truly think that Southern California could go a long way toward taking care of its water problem if, if, if you folks just got over your love affair with lawns. You know, that would be a, a, good, a pretty good start. You know, but, but I love that photograph because people, especially sort of the lefty geographers, they talk about constructed landscapes, right? Now this is a constructed landscape. This is, uh, this, the right is the real world and the left world is, 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 is the idyllic one. Um, okay, so there are some indulgent uses of water, pools, lawns, 10 uh, shower heads, bottled water. But Water also is very important for keeping the lights on. And water is essential to virtually every kind of energy production, including um, ethanol. And uh, what I find interesting about this story is that it takes four gallons of water to produce one gallon of ethanol, even if you're in a plant that recycles its water. But first you have to grow the corn. And so if you're any place east of about mid-Texas, that's okay because it's all dry land farm. And so it's just mother nature. But the moment you go past there, and once you go past the 100th meridian, then it's all irrigation farm. And corn's very water consumptive. It can take 2,500 gallons of water to produce enough corn to refine one gallon of ethanol. Oh, and by the way, Congress has proclaimed that we should produce 36 billion gallons of ethanol by 2022. Now that math I can't do, but it's a lot of zeros at the end for ethanol. And we seem to have an insatiable desire for energy. And it takes a lot of water to produce energy, and it takes a lot of energy to move, pump, cleanse, and treat water. You know better than I, 19% of all of the electricity you use in the state is just moving water around and treating it. And then there are other kinds of energy production and energy use. Here's my favorite. <clears throat> no, this is not Sam's Club or Costco. This is Google. Google, wait a minute, don't they have that Mountain View campus and you get massages all day? No. <laughs> this, is, this is, when you do a Google search, this is what goes on. This is a Google server farm. And inside are tens of thousands of computers, all hooked up, all generating heat. They have to dissipate the heat. What do they use? They use water. Because water is a great coolant, as we know from the radiators in our automobiles. The demand for energy. The cloud. Where is that cloud? Well, it's not up in the air. But most of our fellow citizens think it's like that, and they treat it as though it's infinite. Uh, Google reports that we, collectively, upload to YouTube 100 hours of video every minute. Okay, those pictures of your cat are not that interesting. <laughs> Stop it. You don't need to keep up with the tweets from the Kardashians, never mind our president. So, <laughs> So I like hockey, I grew up in Boston, so I put the Boston Bruins thing up here, but I was shocked. National Hockey League teams use 300 million gallons of water a year to run their stadiums. Now there's an important point behind that. Virtually every business needs water. And so water is of course essential to life and it's critical for the environment. It also is critical for the well-being of our economy and our society. Water lubricates the American economy just as oil does. It's critical that we have enough. So what are we going to do about it? Well, business as usual is not an option. And what does business as usual mean? Usually it means we divert even more water from our rivers than we now are, or we build new dams. We're really good in the United States at building dams. 
In fact, we have two agencies, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers, and their basic, their essential mission, I don't want to simplify it, but their essential mission is if water's moving, stop it. <laughs> We're taking out dams. We're not building new ones. Uh, now, you may build a couple of tunnels here. I understand that that may happen. Uh, and, and then finally, there's groundwater pumping. And this is the uh, uh, USGS slide from the Central Valley. Uh, and it, it shows, if you look at the bottom, that's where the earth was, where the earth is now, and where the earth used to be 50 years ago is at the very top of the slide. And I have to tell you, I come from a state that you all look down on. You are progressive Californians, and I come, I come from Arizona. And you don't use the words Arizona and progressive in the same sentence. <laughs> Doesn't happen. But when it comes to water, we are so far ahead of you. I mean, as we sit here this afternoon, you still do not regulate groundwater pumping. Hello? Anyone home? Still don't regulate? I know you passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but, and you could take some pride in it. But Arizona did something like that in 1980, and you did it in 2014, and you still are suffering the consequences from it. At the very least, we know drilling more wells is not going to get the job done. So what can you do? Well, we can go elsewhere. This is an actual billboard from the state of Michigan. And I, I, uh, I taught at Wayne State for a while, and I get invited back. And whenever I go back to Michigan or the Midwest, I put this up, and I scold them. I say, this, this is a scurrilous attack on those of us in the Southwest, the idea that we want to divert all of the Great Lakes. <laughs> Frankly, we would be happy with one of the smaller ones. <laughs> <clears throat> and then there's cloud seeding, another idiotic idea. Uh, so weather modification is the way the, the, the advocates prefer to call it. But the National Research Council did this huge study and it concluded that after six decades of experiments, there's still no proof that it works. That doesn't keep people from, not, from dumping money into it, though. You never know. Maybe there will be more rain. But I ask you, as sensible human beings in the water world, would you trust your water supply to these two guys? <laughs> All right, so business as usual is not going to get the job done. How about conservation? Yeah, actually, it remains the low-hanging fruit. Let me suggest two things you can do. One, stop using your kitchen food disposal. Really, yeah. If you use that two minutes a day, by the end of the month, you'll have used 150 gallons of water just to get rid of food scraps. Put the food scraps in the trash or your compost but don't use potable water to get rid of food scraps. Second, turn off a light. Uh, researchers at Virginia Tech have found that a single 60-watt incandescent bulb that burns 12 hours a day may, may, by the end of the year, use as much as 6,300 gallons of water to produce the energy. So if you want to save water, turn off a light. There's a lot of interesting things happening in the world of conservation. And there's a, really a very, very good news story to water in the United States. And it comes through the most recent USGS five-year study. Um, and it found that virtually every user group in the United States is using less than it did 20 or 30 years ago. So cities like, like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Tucson, they're supplying um, uh, Less water now, although their populations have grown tremendously. And the story here is a pretty interesting one. It's really about effective government rules and regulations. The drivers, more than anything else, are the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. The Clean Air Act has driven uh, power plants to, to have fewer emissions, and that has often meant revamping how they, they uh, run their, their, their turbines. And that has often meant using less water. And on the domestic side, EPA's water sense program. You can't get a six gallon per flush toilet anymore. 
uh, front load loading washing machines. Uh, sh the shower heads are now a fraction of what they used to be. And when you start to have new housing stock come in and old toilets and shower heads replaced, every time you do that, you're saving more water. So that's, that's the good story. There are still other people who think we need to go farther. And one of them is uh, uh, Pat Melroy from Las Vegas. Uh, she, uh, well, for one thing, she pioneered in the program to pay people to rip out lawns. Now, Matt's done that here, and other, I think San Diego's done it during your drought, but it came from Las Vegas. And then the other thing she's done is she's been running public service announcements on Las Vegas television to try to persuade people to use less water. So here, take a look at this one. Can I help you? Oh! Oh! <laughs> to find your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com. Las Vegas has a different sense about what's appropriate for television that's most. <laughs> Uh, water harvesting uh, has really taken off. This is a photo from San Juan Island off of Seattle. Uh, they, they, if it looks like a silo from Nebraska, it's because it is a silo from Nebraska. So they collect the water that hits the roof in the rainy season, store it here, run it through an RO system, put some ultraviolet light on it, some disinfectant, and they're off the water grid. Pretty, pretty creative kind of conservation. Uh, not everyone, however, has the conservation message. Uh, I love this one. Uh, <laughs> He's a member of the water board, and he's washing down his driveway. Um, you know, just, you know, some things speak for themselves, I suppose. So, so, uh, so conservation's number one. Uh, reuse is two. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that one with you folks. Um, uh, I'm not here to tell you to elbow Fido out of the way. No, I'm not, no. And we now know from this morning's presentations that uh, uh, not only indirect, but direct potable use is certainly viable, and we can go down that path. Uh, I don't even need to go that far. I'd like to go considerably less far. And my, my point of uh, derision will be the city of LA's uh, Hyperion treatment plant. Uh, it produces a volume of water equal to the seventh largest river in the country, and virtually every drop of that has ended up in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we, we need to do better. Uh, if it's not going to be for potable purposes, at least you could take a page out of Arizona's playbook. All the golf courses, parks, highways, cemeteries, uh, uh, Google starting to use some, some uh, recycled water for its uh, server farms, so we really can do a lot better. Long term, of course, the problem for you engineers is that the sewage plants, the treatment plants, are always located at the low point of the basin and you'd use it and, and send it down river or to the ocean or whatever. And what we really need to be thinking about is, is uh, smaller uh, uh, plants located up gradient so that you can use the water locally. So reuse water is, is uh, a second uh, viable solution. It's not um, a silver bullet. Uh, it's expensive uh, compared to other sources of water even. Uh, it requires typically a, a separate system of pipes, often pi painted purple, um, so you have some, some challenges. Still, it's water we already have, and so I think what you're doing is, is great. So let's talk about a third option. That would be desalination. Uh, and here, too, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. The membranes in an RO system are really expensive. Not as expensive as they used to be, but still expensive. Uh, they frequently foul. They require frequent replacement. So cost is one. Uh, energy, all done under pressure. So water energy nexus, and you got to pay for that energy. And then the brine stream. You know, what do you do with the salt, the, the concentrated salt that's left over? All of those are, are big challenges for desal. Um, the Carlsbad uh, Poseidon plant, I think, is, is notable for how long it took 
16 or 18 years. Budget came in at a billion, not at 500 million. Um, so it's, it's not for the faint of heart to go down the path of trying to permit a desal plant. Um, but still, if you have a high value use, a few other options, part of your portfolio is going to be um, ocean desal. I think maybe more exciting and more viable <coughs> is uh, brackish water desal. Uh, El Paso did this with a, a plant named after the former senator. Um, and uh, the thing is, as you know better than I, is the, the expense of desal is tremendously lowered if the input water is higher quality, has less salt in it to begin with. And so brackish water supplies, a lot of people are starting to think that there's some places where we could, uh, we could make uh, good use of that. So conservation, reuse, desal are three spokes in, in, in the wheel. Uh, fourth is uh, price signals. Um, this, is, uh, this is one I'm very passionate about. Uh, I think it's incredibly Im important. And the problem starts from the fact that we're spoiled. We wake up in the morning, we turn on the tap, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or cable television. When most of our fellow citizens think about the water, they think about it as though it were the air, as though it were infinite and inexhaustible. When for all practical purposes, of course, it's finite and exhaustible. And when we talk about paying for water, you know, actually our fellow citizens and ourselves, we're not paying for water. What we're paying for is the cost of service. There's no commodity charge for the water. And the way that water rates are structured, in some places, they're decreasing block rates. In others, they're a flat rate. In Fresno and Sacramento, for the longest time, they, they, they resisted having any meters. Well, you can't manage what you don't measure. So we need to be thinking about how to price water appropriately. And my idea is to start with a human right to water. It turns out that's not a lot of water. Somewhere between 12 and 15 gallons per person per day will, will, will take care of that. Multiplied by the 300 million of us in the United States, that turns out to be 1% of the water we use every day. So let's do that. It's the right thing to do, and it removes a political challenge to why we need to price water. Because some people say, oh, how can you price water? Well, actually, pretty easily. Well, but it came from God. Well, God forgot to lay the pipes. You know? So, so we, need to, we need to pay for the pipes, and we need to make sure that there's treatment, and we need to take care of it. And, and one of the big problems in, in your industry is that the rates being based on the cost of service means that if there's a decline in the amount of water that your customer base is using, you got a revenue problem. And that, you saw that during the drought kind of the conservation death spiral. And I'm sure some of you in this room had the unhappy experience of begging your users to meet with Governor Brown's 35% reduction uh, target, and they did, and then you said, oh, thank you, here's your bill. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that's, that's called uh, term limits, yeah, term limits. <laughs> but no, I don't care about that, though, and the reason why I don't care about that is I have tenure. Um, we've got to give more water out to people of lower means, lower ability to pay. And Philadelphia is the first in the country, I think, to do this. Um, it may seem like it's cheap, and it is cheap, but it still is not affordable to many of our fellow citizens, which makes it even more challenging for you to, to to supply more people with water if there's no revenue stream, stream coming in. The, one of the reasons I think water pricing is so critical is that as I go around, I meet inventors and engineers who have, who have built better water mousetraps, things that work. But what is so sad is that almost to a person, none of them has a viable business plan because the price of water is just too low. So we need to have a serious adult conversation. We need increasing block rates. We need them to be seasonally adjusted so that if you want a swimming pool, if you want to have the lush lawn in that photograph from Palm Springs, you can do it, but by golly, you're going to have, have to pay for it. 
Um, what's happened in California is, is that when you had the conservation death spiral, um, the regulators agreed that agencies could, could ease up on the standards, and that's what's happened, and the water use is starting to go back up. So it's, it's what I think we could appropriately call the hydro-illogical cycle. Uh, where you start at the bottom with drought, you go left, you become aware, you become concerned, you panic, but then it rains. Hey, all's good. Hey, all's good with the world, and apathy reigns. And so I think uh, it remains to be seen whether the, all of the good work during the, the last few years in California is going to hold. Will people go back to lush landscaping, those that ripped it out? Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens next. So price signals. Um, market forces. Uh, I, th I think this is uh, a really overlooked uh, tool in the policy toolkit. And um, uh, I did do a piece, uh, a report for Brookings uh, three years ago. It's available at the Brookings site for free downloading. Uh, my publisher, Island Press, brought it out as a free ebook. So if you do Kindle or something and you'd like, like that, um, I think that's uh, another place you can go. It, it takes more of a deep dive into some of the legal problems, the legal water law problems that we need to change if we're going to encourage the movement of water from, from one place to another. But, but our idea is fairly simple. You start by looking at the value of water, and there are some fairly dramatic differences in how people use water around the West. So in Yuma, Arizona, if you grew uh, alfalfa, uh, you'd generate about 900 bucks per acre foot to grow alfalfa. Uh, lettuce growers in the same area generate about 6,000. But Intel, Intel's core, du core two duo chips generate about 13 million per acre foot. So the opportunities for trade are absolutely stunning. But there's a problem here, and the problem is. When you start talking like this, the farmers get nervous. And I don't blame them for getting nervous. I mean, they see themselves with a big bullseye on their chest. Well, they are consuming 80% of the water. And so that's going to happen. But then you see, I, during the drought, I would see these reckless comments from editorial writers in the LA Times, the New York Times. And if I read one more time that it took a gallon of water to grow an almond, I was going to kick the dog. And, and I don't have a dog, so I was, so I was going to borrow a dog. So, so uh, yeah, well, it takes 158 gallons to grow a watermelon. I mean, it takes a lot of water to grow anything, and we all like to eat. And we have the cheapest food on earth, and it's never been a smaller percentage of our income. Farmers have done unbelievable stuff for us. So we need to do better by how we think they should behave. Because it's worth remembering, it's their water and their water rights. So I've learned this the hard way. Uh, I broke the story that Western farmers were uh, using 100 billion gallons of water each year to grow alfalfa that then got shipped to China. I did that in the Wall Street Journal about four or five years ago. And I thought I was being a friend of, a far of the farmers because what we were arguing was, look at those farmers should be able to not use the water and then sell the water they are not using to cities or to uh, nut producers, you know, uh, people with high value orchards. But that wasn't the message that was heard. And I, had, I will never forget the, the ag school dean at Arizona came over, I was, we were together, put his arm around me and said, Robert, do you have any idea how much trouble you're causing me with my donors in Yuma? <clears throat> OK, coach, I can play center field. So put me in. So I've been going over to Yuma. And it's been relatively successful. I think I've, I think I've heard what they have to say. And I think they've heard what, what I'm, I'm trying to do. And so one of the things I've tried to make a very strong point about is, do the cities need more water? Yes. Do you have a lot of water? Yes. But is the future of agricultural regions in the West imperiled by this? No. Why? Because of this statistic here. A 4% reduction in ag consumption translates into a 50% increase in the water available from municipal and industrial consumption. So we're really only talking about a low single digit change. And there's not a farmer who could look me in the face and say, we can't do that. 
So I put up, I don't have it here, but I put it up for them. There were about 400 farmers in this group. And I put it up and I said, in 2035, the slide, I want to see a show of hands, farmers will use more water about the same or less. Okay, more water, not a hand. About the same, five or six. Less, the whole room. So farmers know it. The question then, the only question then, is how do farmers get from point A to point B? Because it is going to happen. And so what we've argued for is, let's have a municipal financing system to encourage farmers to modernize their infrastructure. Right now, as we sit here this afternoon, still more than 50% of all the ag land in the West is flood irrigated. We can do better. I've seen it with my own eyes. There's an Israeli company, Netafim, that does subsurface drip irrigation even for alfalfa, and it works. But you know what? It's expensive. And farmers tend to be real estate rich and, and cash flow poor. So let's have a system where the 2,500 or 3,000 bucks per acre to put in subsurface drip is paid for by the cities and industry. And in exchange, the cities or industry will take the water conserved. So it's a win-win. Farmers grow with the same amount of product as before, the cities get a little more water, and this improvement is paid for by the, by, by, by the city folks. So I think the menu is a robust one. Conservation, reuse, desal, price signals, reallocation. Those are five powerful tools for solving our water crisis. So just a, a few more comments on, on the water industry. So I did a piece for the uh, American Water Works Association this past, just a year ago. Kind of, a, it, it doesn't affect too many of you. This is a private water company. But 15% of people in the country do get water from private water companies. This one was just outside of Manhattan, Rockland County, and it was uh, United Water New York. And they proposed in uh, 2007 that they would build a desal plant on the Hudson. And the, the, the political officials thought that was a great idea. The U New York Public Services Commission thought it was a great idea. Three years later, the P PSC said, come on, where's this plant? Come on, get this thing online. Three years after that, in 2013, they said, you know, our staff just looked at this and we don't think you need all that water, so forget it. And the company said, uh, and the 56 million that we're, we're in hock that we've already spent on doing this, uh, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> well, and so my message is, you know, don't raise your head, don't let yourself be caught between political officials who are running the PUCs around the country and, and the voters. Now keep your head down. If you've got a water problem, don't th be in in inventive. Don't think about creative ways of new or new supplies. Just go to Home Depot, you know, buy some duct tape, and, and you'll, be, you'll be good to go. And that's the problem. <clears throat> we have public utility commissions who are steeped in cheap water. All you had to do was to put a pipe in the river drill a new well, that's gone. And they haven't learned that lesson. And there's a lot of pressure on the water industry because they can't predict that there will be reliable pass-through of the costs that they invent, or that they invest if they're doing aquifer storage and recovery, desalination, or, uh, or, or some of the other things that you were talking about this morning. So that's a challenge going forward. Uh, second challenge is Flint. Now, that children in the United States drank poisoned water is criminal, unforgivable. But Flint could have happened in hundreds of communities around the country. Flint, at bottom, was a failure to maintain the infrastructure. It was not maintained, and there are a lot of other communities the whole Ohio River Valley with lead pipes in them. And it just happened to be Flint. And what this means is we're, we're not adhering or upholding the proud tradition that we have of virtually universal access to water and sanitation. It's something unrivaled in the history of the world. 
and we're letting it slip through our fingers. People are starting to doubt the, 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 the safety of public water supply. That's, that's a horrible thing to have happening. We need, we need to put resources into our water and wastewater system. And it will be challenging. It will be challenging even though there's all kinds of economic reasons to do so. Job creation, economic stimulus, avoiding deferred costs. You, you know the routine. It just makes sense. But it's not going to come from the feds. The feds, in, in 1972, when the Clean Water Act passed, the feds were deeply engaged in water and, and, and treatment. In fact, between 60 and 70 percent of all the investment in water and wastewater came from the federal government. Now, it's about 10 percent. On a per capita basis, the federal government devotes $11 per capita to water and wastewater, 11. It's the lowest of any kind of infrastructure, any kind of investment in the future. And that leaves it as a real challenge for the states to finance the program. Even in Mr. Obama's uh, seven or 800 billion after the 08 crisis, Something like only six or eight billion went into water and wastewater. Now, six or eight billion is not chump change, but we need more like a trillion than six or eight billion. So trying to finance that is going to be exceedingly challenging. Uh, one of the things that some people are, are keen on, I, I think done right, it has a lot of promise, is to tap the capital markets through private-public partnerships. So triple P's have the potential of generating money that you can use to put into infrastructure. Of course, you have to give the people, you know, the carrot. You got to give them the money back and let them make some money on it. But still, it does, it does uh, offer a source of funds. Uh, Long-term bonds are another thing. Um, rather than 30 or even 50-year bonds, go out 100 years. Uh, the, uh, the DC uh, water folks uh, did exactly that. They floated 100-year bonds. And just as with a car loan or a mortgage, if you can have a longer period for payback, suddenly that monthly hit doesn't look so bad. So that's another way to be thinking about, about funding this, this system. Uh, meanwhile, there are, there are people like George Hawkins in DC and others who are doing just astonishing things in wastewater, uh, getting the nutrients out of the system, getting energy out of it, producing water. It's an exciting time, but it takes money to do it well. At the end of the day, I'm very optimistic. I think there's never been more support in the public at large. Public opinion polls are showing this. They want safe water. They want good, good sewer systems. And now what we need, what we really need more than anything else, is the political will and the moral courage and the resources to act. Thanks. I think we have time, uh, probably about five, six minutes for some questions. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Glennon while he's here? Uh, wait, uh, if you would be so kind to wait for the microphone to make it over to you so we can record the question for posterity. What? Oh, back in the back. Oh, thank you. Uh, great presentation. I don't have question, but I have a gentle comment on one area. You said water conservation. I love it. I'm 100% with you on this. But also you said, don't put organic material to garbage disposal, kitchen disposal. So we are trying to reduce organic loads to landfill. This is our objective also as a water, is a whole system. Mm -hmm. So with this approach, you are basically putting more vulnerability on the landfill side, not putting those things to wastewater treatment plant for better carbon diversion. Yeah. I would suggest otherwise. Use kitchen disposal as much as you can, but look for other opportunities to do water conservation. Reduce the shower time, use water efficient appliances home, but not do the other thing. So yeah. this is my comment. Okay, well we, we can agree to, to disagree on that. Uh, and I do disagree. Uh, the, the problem when you think about all of the money that's gone into water treatment by the time it gets to the home, one of the tragedies is that 
we use so little of it for drinking, you know, 10%, 15%. Fully a third of the water that's potable water that you're delivering is used outside for landscaping. Of the indoor use, fully a third of that is flushed away. I mean, don't get me going on the idiocy of using potable water to flush human waste, you know. That, I'll, 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 I'll just, I'll, I'll start foaming, you know, that would be, that'd be bad. Um, and uh, I have a different approach toward what I use water for in the sink, and I am probably adding more to the landfills. Let me give you an example. Uh, a peanut butter jar. I do not wash, I do not use potable water to wash out the peanut butter jar so I can show it, throw this useless piece of, of, of glass into the trash where it's never going to be recycled for anything. I, can, I feel good because it's recycled, but in fact, it's never going to be recycled for anything. I'm just going to throw it away. So I, I decide, is something worth using the water for? And for me, um, the, the small amount that's added by putting that into, into the trash is, is an easy call. But you know, we, we will agree to disagree. Yeah. Are there other questions for Dr. Glennon while we have them? OK, see none. Thank you, Dr. Glennon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.